Hello, my name is Michael William Doyle. I'm Associate Professor of History and Director of the Oral History Workshop at Ball State University. Uh, today's date is Friday, the 25th of January uh, 2019, and I'm continuing an interview with Provost Emeritus Warren Vanderhill, uh, which is a continuation of an interview we began one week ago today on January 18th. Warren, Welcome again. Thank you for taking time from your schedule to uh, come in and help us understand more about your life and career at Ball State. My, my great pleasure to join you once again. Thank you. Uh, interviewing the interviewer. <laughs> yeah, right. I mentioned last time that you've done more oral history probably than anybody else uh, mm -hmm. in within 50 mile radius of here. Yeah, probably. And it was actually a kind of a second career for you as well. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing better than somebody who has studied history, then been part of making history, to then help to document uh, the past and to bring a historian's perspective to it. So I'm delighted to have you as the first person we're interviewing for the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project. Where we left off a week ago, uh, we had just arrived at that point where you had assumed right. uh, the directorship of what then was called the Honors Program, uh, poised to become the Honors College uh, under your uh, uh, directorship. And I'd like to um, start from that uh, mm -hmm. point of time uh, to ask you if you could reflect on the program as mm -hmm. you found it right. uh, when you were asked to take over. Well, the honors program was, I guess, the very definition of a program. It was very loosely structured. Uh, there were a few hundred students who more or less identified with being in the honors program. There hadn't been really very much record keeping uh, of who was in and who was out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what they did, the the core then was a run academic quarters at that point in time in Ball State's history. Mm -hmm. So the students took a year-long course, a traditional great books course, which we refer to as the humanities course, and indeed mm -hmm. still do to this day. They then were required to take two honors colloquia, which were small discussion classes, usually taken when they were uh, juniors and seniors, although a few would take them as sophomores. Uh, in addition, they had to do a senior thesis or creative project, usually done in the major with a professor in their home department. And then there were a number of courses that were part of the general studies curriculum. Uh, one that I'm most familiar with was one that you may still have here, History 203, which is recent American history. And so they'd offer what they call an H section. Uh, so you'd have an uh, English composition course with an H on it. Uh, what that meant is the professor was more or less hand-picked to be the person teaching the class. The enrollment was usually from 15 to 20 students. Uh, the vivid contrast would be with the history classes that were usually large classes. So a normal section of History 203 might have anywhere from 100 to 300 students in it. The honors section would have 20 to 25. And the professor would be somebody who usually had a liberal arts college background and had more interest in working with that population in a small group setting. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty much it. Uh, the courses that really counted toward graduation with honors, in addition to having at least an overall GPA of uh, 3.275, um, was to have completed the humanities sequence, uh, having taken two honors colloquia, and successfully done a senior honors thesis or creative project. Once you had done those fairly minimal requirements, uh, that certified you to be a graduate of the honors program. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And so what I inherited was that as a program. And as I said, it was fairly loosely organized in terms of the freshmen who came through orientation in the summer when they began their studies, students accepted with distinction, do you want to be in the honors program or not? And they, I guess, probably originally about 70 to 80% of them said, yeah, I'd like to give that a try. And it was sort of, well, you know, you got to take general studies anyway. Well, why don't you try the honors program? And so that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much stayed that way until, oh, probably about 1974, 1975. Okay. Now, um I alluded to the fact last time that I had uh, earned honors at the University right. of Wisconsin-Madison, and it does not have an honors college. Right. It has a program, right. and uh, there were some honors courses that were limited to people that were right. in the honors program. Uh, but for the most part, 
it was uh, a request by the student of a faculty member if they could take a particular course oh, okay. for honors. Right. And typically that involved doing some extra work. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, faculty member didn't really want to do right. a lot of extra right. work typically. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I missed uh, from that experience once I started taking a couple of the mm -hmm. designated honors only classes was exactly what it right. seemed like you folks had uh, brought about here at Ball State. Uh, just a higher level of engagement and discussion. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned something last time which I thought yeah. was utterly fascinating, and that was this open-mindedness to trusting the students to mm -hmm. be able to make meaningful contributions to the direction that a particular seminar or colloquium might go with their ideas and mm -hmm. uh, their participation. Uh, today that's considered to be yeah. best teaching practices, right. uh, but many of the more hidebound uh, mm -hmm. teachers are um, they want total control. They mm -hmm. want to tell the students, this is what we're going to do, mm -hmm. and speak only if I call right. on you. Uh, well, that's definitely true. And there, there was a student honors council. And so there was a group, I think, of about a dozen students. I really can't recall specifically how they got on the student honors council. But they would meet with the director, in my case, uh, me at that point in time, oh, probably once or twice a quarter and talk about things they'd like to consider doing as part of the honors program. Uh, there also, within the university governance structure, was an honors committee, subcommittee of something in the university senate. Mm -hmm. And there you had representatives from different colleges and different departments, mm -hmm. and they would probably meet once a quarter also to talk about the direction and the future of the mm -hmm. honors program. We found a document uh, when Dwight Hoover of the history right. department, who becomes the first uh, director of the Center for Middletown right. Studies, right. Uh, who was then chairing that uh, committee, mm -hmm. and Francis Rippey, I noticed, yeah. was uh, right. on it, and Rich Wires, right. I think, as well. So right. it seemed like there was quite yeah. heavy uh, involvement of the history uh, faculty, and you mentioned before that English was also yeah. another one of the main providers. Yeah, I would say those, are, those two departments were the real heart of the honors program at that point in time. Uh, so the majority of people who taught, there were no science courses, um, you drew them from two fairly large faculties. When you consider the size of the English faculty at that time and the history faculty, they were two of, without question, two of the largest faculty groups within what became the College of Sciences and Humanities after Teachers College became a university. Mm -hmm. And we talked last time, coincidentally, that uh, history and English were also the two streams that joined together to form the American Studies movement. Yeah, and right. You having come from a doctoral yeah. program and that that was yeah, quite, that's uh, definitely true. Fascinating. Yeah. You were able to speak both their languages. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to um, the consideration about the honors uh, classes. Uh, you mentioned 25 students. Mm -hmm. um, given that the enrollment of Ball State was not that uh, great uh, in 1970 mm -hmm. uh, when you uh, took over, uh, was there a concern ever that uh, an honors designated section did not make? Was there a make mark? I mean, what happens if you only had 15 instead of yeah. 25 students that signed up? Uh, there may have been, and I think the magic number at that point in time might have been 10. Uh, I do not recall very many honors classes that didn't make. Uh, I can recall some honors colloquia, the junior, senior, small discussion group classes that had, oh, maybe seven or eight students. And you know, unlike today, we just, we just let them go. We, we taught some courses with less than 10 students. Mm -hmm. Well, 10 is still the make mark for the university. Oh, okay. You have to get special permission right. if yeah. it dil dips below that. Yeah. And um, on, unless things have changed in just the last right. year, um, you have to get permission from the dean okay. to uh, have an undergrad class, and each unit gets one okay. per semester. They're okay. very strict. Yeah. Uh, this is about productivity yeah. in, in yeah. terms of yeah. the ratio of, uh, of students yeah. to faculty. So maybe that's uh, some continuity mm -hmm. from that earlier period, yeah. too. Um, the uh, Honors Council uh, that the students um, uh, constituted do you recall, were they elected in, in some sort of a election by the students uh, early they, they in the may, term? They may have been elected by the, uh, the university student governance system. Oh. I'm not really sure, but you did have a university governance system. There mm -hmm. was a student body president, mm -hmm. uh, like they have today, where they ran mm -hmm. for office uh, with a slate, mm -hmm. not as political or as PR-oriented as today. Mm -hmm. But that probably was within that Okay. Organizational setting. Would honor non-honor students have been able to vote for honors uh, council reps? Well, I'm not sure. Well, I think you voted for a president and a slate, vice president, secretary, treasurer, et cetera. 
But I think once that governance uh, group was in, I was going to say in power, <laughs> once they were in power for the following year. Bloodless coup. Yeah, th then, I mean, I think pretty much to be candid, any student who wanted to be on the Student Honors Council could pretty much, I think I'd like to try that. So it was more of a resume building thing as I look mm -hmm. back on it. Mm -hmm. Early involvement from the students in uh, shaping the policy or yeah. a direction that the uh, curriculum took. Right. Uh, from an early uh, period, the honors program had a house mm -hmm. uh, or a designated area right. within an existing yeah, yeah. Uh, building. Right. Uh, right before you took over, so under Sandy uh, McGibbon, right. um, the, uh, a house was acquired on North right. Street. Right. Does that house still exist today? Do you no, know? No, it's a parking lot. Oh, okay. Uh, Maybe you mentioned that last two time. Two blocks south of campus. It is a house that to some degree the university bought because me now, they had to find a place to put retired President John R. Emmons. Oh. So President Emmons retired. President Proust came here from mm -hmm. Western Michigan, John Proust. And President Emmons was still doing a lot of consulting for the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. And the university didn't want to give him a full-time secretary. And so what they did was decide, okay, if Dr. Emmons, Jack Emmons, to all of us who knew him, was going to have a half-time secretary, thought that was fine, okay, he accepted that. What are we going to do with the other half of the secretary's time? And that's how the honors program got its first secretary. I see. So the person... First half secretary. Yeah. The person in that position when I became honors program director, I had a halftime secretary and shared that person with Jack Emmons. Mm -hmm. In that house, the administrative office was on the first floor, which would have been the kitchen area of the house. Dr. Emmons was on the first floor. Very nice furniture that had been given to him by one of the local economic powers in the community. Mm -hmm. And my office was on the second floor along with the seminar room and an office for a part-time assistant director. And some honors courses were taught there, usually humanities courses or an honors colloquium. Uh, and then we had no difficulty whatsoever deciding how many hours of the secretary's time would I get and how many would Dr. Emmons get. So it really worked out great. Mm -hmm. uh, he enjoyed being there because there were always students around there mm -hmm. and they got to know him. Oh, Dr. Dr. Emmons as well, yes. And so it was a combination of honors program and emeritus president John Emmons. Right. And that, so we were in there for a fair period of time. Do you think that might have had the effect of raising your profile a little bit, that they would have considered you to be sort of parallel? On yeah, well, a, a I don't know about the parallel. Yeah, well, in I, other words, I, they wouldn't yeah. have put somebody in there that... Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it was a, a wonderful experience because here's this man, you know, the, the great old venerated president of Ball State for many years that went from Ball State Teachers College to Ball State just becoming a fledgling university. Mm -hmm. But it enabled me as a very young faculty member to get to know him. And one of the things that Jack Evans loved to do was to come out of his office at 10 o'clock in the morning every day and light up a cigar, usually a White Owl or an R.G. Dunn. And he smoked them in a holder. I'll never forget that, an amber cigar holder. And he'd sit on this couch in the living room and have a cup of coffee, and he always had some raisin cookies from Concannons, and he'd invite me down and say, now let me tell you about this. And it'd be the topic of the day. I mean, it could have been his stock portfolio uh, or his summer home in Michigan. He was from Michigan. Uh, and so it was a, a kind of ongoing tutorial for me, learning about the time after World War II up until that point in time in the early 1970s, when Jack Emmons was the president of Ball State University. He retired in the late 1960s. So I look back on it as one of the very influential times in my life because I began to hear about this transition that was occurring nationally where teachers' colleges were becoming universities. And Jack Emmons said he didn't want to be a president of a university. He, the great quote I recall is, I wanted to be the president of a first-rate teachers' college and not a third-rate university. Because his view was that all of these teachers' colleges, normal schools, becoming universities would go through a great period of growing pain and would not become full-fledged universities for quite a long period of time. And in the case of Ball State, we know that was certainly the case. And he would then tell me about what his life was like as a school superintendent in Michigan, Jackson, Michigan. 
what it was like to become the president of a teacher's college, or as he put it, a first-rate teacher's college up there with you know, Columbia teachers and important institutions of that kind. And so it was an ongoing kind of tutorial, kind of a seminar. It wasn't that he had a lot of knowledge of honors education, but he was very proud of the fact that this teacher's college just become a university had an honors program. But I think you're, you're absolutely right. There's no question having him down there certainly raised the profile of the honors program. Something you said uh, brings to mind uh, something I heard repeatedly in 2015, 2017, when we were doing the Ball State University African American Alumni Oral History Project. We were very keen on interviewing people who had uh, earned their degrees uh, between the 1950s and the present, mm -hmm. trying to focus on especially the, the uh, early decades. And one of the things that our African American alums uh, said um, repeatedly, uh, three, four times came up in the interviews, that there was an outreach effort to attract students of color from the Deep South mm -hmm. during the Civil Rights era. And many of these students wanted to get out of the old Jim Crow vicinity yeah. to prove right. that they could make it in something other mm -hmm. than a historically black college or university. And that Ball State's reputation was second to none, although they would usually qualify to say there was Columbia University's right. uh, Columbia Teachers Teacher, College, yeah. right. and then there was Ball State. Yeah, true. And the first time I heard that, I thought, well, that's you know bluster uh, right. and, and boosterism. But when I heard it a second and a third time, the people that came up north knowing nobody, right. knowing family up here at all, uh, there must have been something in the uh, period during uh, Emmons' tenure mm -hmm. that um, you had a, a, a reputation yeah. of uh, natural mm -hmm. national stature. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, you just mentioned that yeah. Western Michigan, we attracted him from there. Right. Um, what would you say as to the accuracy of that reputation? Well, I, I, I think it's true, and I think it's because they stayed to, we are a teacher's college, and for a long period of time resisted becoming a university. And I think that when the trustees decided and the state of Indiana decided that both Indiana State and Ball State were going to become universities, I don't know how much acceptance of that there was for someone like Jack Emmons, who really saw himself as a teacher educator. I think what you're referring to in terms of the African-American students is numbers of graduates. And so you had this Midwestern school that not only prided itself on being like Columbia Teachers College, but turned out teachers that went all over the Midwest and indeed into the South and the Southwest once they had their teaching credential and, and did very well. I mean, they became very well-known classroom teachers and very well-known K-12 administrators. So I think, I think that that observation is, is correct. Well, and I believe that some of those then in their careers advise students yeah. that Ball State would be a yeah. good fit for them and may have been uh, recruiting essentially informally. Oh, I think that's true, yeah, definitely. As well. yeah. Do you think, looking back now uh, across the reach of time, and I know that I'm moving mm -hmm. around chronologically, yeah, sure. that there was some truth to the statement that Ball State is still a teacher's college with a comprehensive university wrapped around its core but its core identity still focuses on the teaching mission? Oh, I think there may be a smidgen of that left. I, when I became provost in the mid-1980s, I think that certainly was still there. I think it diminishes on a kind of annual basis. I, I think there's a little bit of that left. I think in the centennial year, we'd like to look back and you know sort of pay more than just lip service of the fact that that's our heritage, that's our tradition. But I, I don't think it's, I don't, I'll put it this way. I know it's a cliche, but there's not that much of a there there mm -hmm. any longer. It certainly was the case when I came here in the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. And for a long period of time, we would refer to ourselves as, well, we're an emerging university. It just took us longer than, say, fellow mid-American conference schools like Miami of Ohio, Ohio University, Kent State, Western Michigan, to emerge. Uh, or the other cliche I'd get here a lot, of, a lot from colleagues both on campus and indeed on other campuses was, well, you're kind of a university in letterhead only. And, and I, you know, that would sort of stick in my crawl when people would say that. And I think mm -hmm. I'd even get that going to national honors conventions or regional honors conventions mm -hmm. where people would say, well, you guys are still, you know, more of a teacher's college than Miami. Well, that was certainly true. Or the other Ohio Max schools where they had more mature doctoral programs mm -hmm. and had more specific what I would call 
teacher-scholar models mm -hmm. uh, for the attainment of tenure and promotion to the senior ranks. Mm -hmm. Those schools were, were at least a decade or so ahead of that. That, that comes up, and I don't want to digress, digress too much on this, when Ball State decides they want to become part of this athletic conference they're part of now. Because even though I was the honors program director, I was also the faculty athletic re representative. And so I had to go with President John Pruce, uh, the athletic director and the head of the university senate, to appear before the Council of Presidents of the Mid-American Conference Universities so they would vote on whether we were going to be allowed to come in the conference or not. And I'll never forget at that meeting, there was no question in my mind that the presidents of places like Toledo, Miami, Ohio University, Northern Illinois, were a little bit condescending in the way they looked at Ball State to say, well, do you really think you're up to it academically to join, albeit an athletic conference, but you know, the way we see ourselves academically. So I mean, there are points along the line in my life that don't particularly pertain to the Honors College where you got that kind of thrown in your face and you'd say, well, you know, you're still more of a teacher's college than a full-blown university. I want to return to that point in just a moment, but first an observation, and this to an American Studies yeah. scholar, uh, reading the built environment. Yeah. Uh, in class, uh, my honors uh, colloq that's uh, doing the Honors College Oral History Project yesterday, uh, we've been talking about the Middletown studies, mm -hmm. and I circulated the uh, issue of Life magazine when oh, yeah. the uh, Middletown yeah. and Transition book had come out yeah. uh, that had uh, an aerial photograph of the campus yeah. uh, from that period right. in the early 30s. Uh, what strikes me today, reading the built environment, that the tallest building on campus is the Teachers College, yeah, that's right. and that symbolically that's at the center. <laughs> Although I notice now that the College of Health is almost at that yeah, height. that's right, yeah. And it, it almost strikes me like in Washington, <laughs> D.C., they won't let any buildings yeah. be built that would be taller than the base of the dome of the Capitol. Right. That Ball State has had this uh, <laughs> notion symbolically, we got one big building, <laughs> yeah. that's where it started, and yeah. the rest of you are kind of like tail on the dog. Well, I think there is some symbolism to that. You know, I, I don't mind, you know, I'm old enough now I can get away with saying things like that, that when I came here and the teacher's college was that large, the people who were not in the teacher's college were in the more traditional academic disciplines that the, the sort of joke was, well, yeah, but it's the Tower of Babel. And so I just sort of let that slide. And I haven't heard that for a long time, but for, for a period of time, especially in the 1970s and 80s, there was that kind of reference point that where you have, sure, Teachers College, largest building in the community, but it's really the Tower of Babel. So let that pass. So let's go back to um, the uh, theme that you just evoked when you were talking about going to the, before the Mid-America Conference. Yeah. My sense of things, and I'd ask uh, for you to comment on this, was that the Honors College became a way to move from what uh, Tony Edmonds and Bruce Gilhood in their Ball State mm -hmm. and Interpretive History uh, talk about are the Jeffersonian and Jacksonian yeah. uh, overlay right. of democratic access. Mm -hmm. uh, you referred last time to the uh, essentially open enrollment uh, right. standards that we had. Yeah, right. And uh, it seems that there was considerable pressure since um, Indiana did not have a uh, community college system. Right to essentially use the mm -hmm. Indiana State, Southern yeah. University of Southern Indiana, Bell State, as de facto weed them out. Right. Um, can't provide remedial learning, but you're going to have to find a way to, to lift them to the point where uh, students who maybe aren't the best mm -hmm. uh, academically prepared uh, can do college level work. Mm -hmm. Well, the IU and Purdue branch campuses serve that function. Mm -hmm. I mean, the decision really was we're not going in the direction of community colleges, but oh, by the way, you can go to IU Kokomo or IU East in Richmond. So you will have an opportunity to take those kinds of academic courses, but you're not gonna do it in Bloomington. You're not gonna do it in West Lafayette. And with us, it was having, shall we say, a fairly open admission policy. So the question is, uh, do you think that the Honors College became a way to add uh, a dimension of excellence and selectivity that helped lift Ball State from this sense that it was lesser than um, and may have been the way that we could, as an institution, show that we could attract excellent students, mm -hmm. retain them, and send them yeah. out to do wonderful things. Yeah, I think that's true. And then I think what really adds to that is the creation in the, oh, the mid-1970s of the Whitinger Scholars Program. I mean, when you add that dimension, which is the kind of 
even more elite within an elite then that really says to the state of Indiana, to the Midwest, really the whole country as far as public relations is concerned, we have a program here where we want you to come here and we will reward you financially with a handsome no-need scholarship to have you come to campus. There's a document that we found in the archives, which was your one-page proposal yeah, right. for the Whitinger Scholars. Yeah. And uh, it seems like there was no meaningful opposition to it. Right. Uh, is that because um, at the point you proposed it, you already knew who was going to fund it? Uh, because it was named for the way yeah, who had been part of the but, but he was not foundation. The funding, he was not the funding person. I mean, the money came from the University Foundation. It was named to honor Ralph Weidinger, president of the Ball State University Foundation at that time and a Ball State graduate. But the money was from the foundation. Uh, it wasn't a bequest from the Weidinger family. Now, it's, it's important because at that time, our enrollment of distinction students was starting to take a downtick. And that alarmed me, and probably as much as any other single factor pushed me to create that kind of program, even though I knew that if we could get foundation funding for it and pushed it up the ladder, if you will, to Vic Lawhead and Rich Burkhardt, John Proust, the Board of Trustees, that it would probably be approved because there was enough of a decline over about a two-year period in the number of people who applied here, except in this top 20% of the freshman class based on high school GPA and verbal SAT, that we had to find some way to say, you know, we got to get those numbers back up again. And so the Whitinger Scholars Program was designed to do a lot of things, but one of them certainly was to try to increase the number of distinction students, and it did do that. Did you make some inquiries first to see if the foundation would support this? There would be money there if they designated no. the scholarships. You know that there would be money to fund no, them? Pro probably these days you might, but I guess I was too naive to think of doing that. And so I, I just figured if, if, the, if the academic affairs area of the university and the foundation area of the university thought it was a good idea, that we, they, they would probably find the money. Mm -hmm. And so there was never a point along the line until we finally got down to, well, how many of these do you want? Um, where someone said to me, well, that probably isn't a good idea. I mean, it's one of those ideas that now has become really part of the institutional culture where a lot of people think, well, gee, somebody must have been against that. And I honestly can't think of anybody who said, well, it's a genuinely bad idea. I mean, everyone seemed to think that to have that kind of scholarship where no one else in the state in the public institutions had that kind of program was to let's get out ahead of the Western Michigans, because they were thinking of putting one in up there, and let's be the only public university in the state of Indiana that has a national competition for no-need scholarships. And I really emphasize that because at that point in time, there was not a lot of no-need scholarship money around. Mm -hmm. Private schools, liberal arts colleges, yes, but not at schools like Ball State. Is that in part because the Ball State didn't really have uh, endowments? True. Yeah, okay. They didn't. And so and that was relatively yeah. typical for the public higher education yeah. uh, institutions yeah. of uh, the yeah. region. Um, yeah, that's true. And uh, so the question came up in um, uh, the uh, colloquium yesterday about the Wings for the Future yeah, campaign right. of the early 90s, yeah, right. which, as I recall, might have been the first capital campaign. Yeah, that was that Ball really State's first attempt to do very large capital fundraising, mm -hmm. yeah. So the Whitinger Scholars, well in advance of that, oh, yeah, yeah. and um, you identified a need. You, it's, it's curious to me that uh, you didn't have to first go and find out if the foundation would even fund no. a thing like this. No. Uh, what if it had been approved and the foundation said, go raise your own money? <laughs> would they well, have done that in those days? Yeah, no. I mean, it, it, there was really no activity with uh, <coughs> deans and department heads and, and, and the emphasis you have now on, you know, go find the money if you want to fund the program. There was none of that in the 1970s. I mean, that, that doesn't come into being until we begin things like the Wings for the Future campaign and get into every few years large capital campaigns. And then you begin to involve a host of people on campus, certainly the deans, certainly a lot of people in the upper levels of the administration in becoming new kinds of individuals in asking people for money. That just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So to go to um, a comment that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you made last time, having to do with the fact that many students came to Ball State 
uh, because they lived proximate to right. uh, the university. We didn't have that many students from out of state. Right. Um, and uh, so convenience might have mm -hmm. been part of it. Uh, the reputation of the teacher's college, right. uh, certainly you, mm -hmm. if you uh, graduated from Ball State with a, a teaching, right. a, a teacher education degree, uh, it was almost a certitude mm -hmm. that you would get a, a job someplace. Right. There was, uh, education was growing right. uh, everywhere with the baby boom generation and such. The um, question then that uh, Ball State sets out a vision to set itself apart uh, from the flagship institutions, IU and Purdue, uh, was there a sense that we had to find a way to do something that those institutions did not do so that there wasn't a, a notion that they would prevent Ball State from doing anything that would compete with uh, what they were already doing? Well, perhaps to some degree, but I mean, you had honors education at that point at IU, uh, but certainly at that point there was no talk of having an honors college. Mm -hmm. uh, so Did Purdue have an honors program? Of no, no, no. They, they didn't. So I mean it, it was in North, North Indiana State and so we were sort of like the the flagship of the state because no one else was even was doing much of this. Uh, the other point I want to make sure that you get in here is when you talk about the student body at that time, the really atypical group in the student body is the College of Architecture. Yes, and so and that's, that's arriving that, at this important well, moment. Well, that's really important because when you talk about Ball State pretty much being a school where 90% of the students were Hoosiers, 10% from various other places, the College of Architecture and Planning by that time, in the late 70s on to the 80s, was already getting to 50% in-state, 50% out-of-state. And to some degree that was becoming a problem because you'd have legislators who'd say, well, my friend down the street, his daughter couldn't get in, and you're taking students from Rhode Island. And the other important point about architecture is architecture had a double admission standard. So you could be admitted to Ball State, but you were not admitted to the College of Architecture and Planning. You had to go through a second admission process. The focus I really want to emphasize here is mm -hmm. virtually every student at that time who was admitted to the College of Architecture and Planning was eligible to be in the Honors College. I mean, their standards were that high. I don't know how much that's changed today, but there's no question in my mind that you had this group of students, a few hundred, and these were students who were all honors college students. And more importantly, they were from all over the place. Now that becomes a really important part of honors because it was a five-year degree program. And they all had to do a project for their fifth or fifth year project for their degree. To expect an architecture honor student to do both a senior thesis and an architecture project just simply was a, no, a non-starter. And so what I had to invent was a way for architecture students to use the materials they used to justify their fifth year project as part of the creative project option to graduate from the Honors College. And we first began doing that with, honor, with architecture students in the early 1970s. Tell me more about that, because it's not clear, uh, yeah. since you mentioned that the sciences hadn't initially right. uh, been part of the curriculum. It was really based on the great books and the right. humanities. Right. Um, so the, the development uh, of the architecture school is right. happening at about the same time that you're bringing the sciences into college. Yes. I want to talk about that yes. separately. But let's go back to this notion of um, what had been called the senior thesis or the honors right. thesis right. in the honors college. What would have been the um, opposition uh, to having considered the one as the other, perhaps with an explicit connection of how the honors education led to the thinking of right. what culminated in the architecture project? Well, it, and it was only done for the College of Architecture and Planning. I mean, there were some other areas, oh, theater I can think of, some of the, uh, the visual arts, the art department. There you would have more emphasis on doing a creative project. And that was pretty much determined by the student picking the faculty member the two of them molding and shaping an idea, and if it turned out to be what we would call a traditional thesis, footnotes, you know, everything you need to have for a history thesis, that's fine. But if the senior faculty mentor certified that this creative option was fulfilled, which the architecture faculty would do almost automatically, that way to enable architecture students to fulfill that requirement and to graduate from the Honors College. Otherwise, there's no way they could have done it. 
Was it uh, solely uh, determined by uh, the dean of the Honors College? Uh, because I'm assuming that you're no longer an Honors Program at the point that this was uh, conjoined. Uh, well, it? yeah, actually it was because I can, I mean, the, the, it's a funny story. The person who was the first architecture student to graduate from the Honors Program is, is still on the faculty in the Honors College, or in architecture, Rod Underwood. Mm -hmm. And so Rod Underwood had done a, an engineering degree at Purdue he had come here and started over again, done a five-year degree, wanted to graduate from the honors program, came to see me and said, we've got to figure out a way to do this so I can fulfill my requirements for the creative project. And I said, well, how do you propose doing it? He came up with a proposal and he was the first person to do it. And that was the model for, from the 1970s on for students in the College of Architecture and Planning. Mm -hmm. You have talked to me about him before uh, yeah. outside this interview. And what I'm interested in is if you could remember how he did that. What, what was his uh, pitch, essentially, that persuaded you that the two um, achievements uh, were solved by one uh, submission, essentially? Well, by that time, he was a non-traditional student. As I said, he already had done a degree in engineering at Purdue. And so he, he very uh, astutely went through the process of developing the manner in which he was going to do his justification for doing a certain fifth year project and brought it to me, not that I knew an awful lot about the details of it, and said, if I have a senior faculty member over there who says this would fulfill the, in his or her view the creative project option of a senior honors thesis or project, would you accept that? And I said, if they will sign off on it, I'll accept that. And that was the beginning of it. So it really devolved to the faculty member in the College of Architecture and Planning to say, okay, I think this is worthy of honors. Mm -hmm. And once the faculty member put his or her, shall we say, signature on the paper, then I just decided to go ahead and accept it. This strikes me again as an example of the collegiality yeah. and the respect. You mentioned that um, the honors program, for that matter, the honors college, uh, would have been impossible if you hadn't been able to borrow faculty yes. from the different departments. True. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that um, Nobody ever said no when you asked no, them if they would be yeah. part of it. Right. Uh, you didn't ask people that you felt were, if I can use the expression, sticks in the mud, yeah. uh, more right. hidebound, traditional, right. not interested right. uh, in what extra work might have mm -hmm. been occasioned by teaching these uh, uh, more talented students, right. perhaps. Um, but did you find that um, there was uh, a sense that the faculty had that they were entrusted with the decisions so that yeah. it wasn't that the dean is going to step in and say, right. you don't know what you're talking about, but more that we'll trust you, you right. trust that we're doing it together, we're educating the students, we want what's best for them. No, I think that's true. I mean, I, you, it was me being in a position for the 15 years that I was in charge of honors education and having respect for faculty members that they were going to have a standard that was high enough that it met whether it was history or biology or geography or architecture, what the faculty member individually saw as honors worthy. And there, there's no way I'm gonna be able to comment on a, a biology senior thesis or an architecture creative project. And so it's, it's you having faith in fellow faculty to ascertain whether this measures up to an honors standard. Mm -hmm. And we did that. And, I, and in candor, I never had anybody say, well, you're wrong, this doesn't. And so they just simply said, well, okay, I mean, if the faculty member individually merit says this merits honors credit then because I got four hours credit for this mm -hmm. then you got the four hours of credit I want to a comment uh, and have you respond if uh, it's the strikes you a particular way that um, the trend line in some universities to look outside uh, academe to bring in people from industry to serve in administrative mm -hmm. posts right. who aren't necessarily faculty oriented no faculty experience prior to this um, this collegiality that you're talking about was essentially part of academic culture oh, because yeah. you were faculty, sure. you understood yeah. how yeah. you could trust people, yeah. their training, their, their judgment. Yeah, the words respect. Uh, and if you have confidence in the people that you have approved to teach honors mm -hmm. and are on this list of faculty who are approved to mentor a creative project or senior thesis, and at that point in time it probably was I don't know, 50 people. But they were all people that in that kind of spirit of collegiality, you'd gotten to know them. And you had respect for their academic integrity. And if they were willing to say, we think this merits honors credit, 
I would simply trust that that was the case and approve it. Uh, and as I said, never anybody say, well, you know, you shouldn't trust these people. These are, you're, you're, you're letting stuff slide. That never happened. That never, never occurred. Related to that is uh, changes in the institutional culture over time to become more um, business-like, shall we say, uh, even the adoption of the term marketing mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. terms of uh, enrollment yeah. marketing yeah. Uh, and management. Uh, this mentality uh, that um, has uh, determined uh, merit salary increases right. based on a point system yeah. that is allocated out by how many points in different categories is so similar to an mm -hmm. accounting. Right. Um, with this uh, uh, development in recent decades to become more like a business, more corporate, <laughs> right. uh, do you think that uh, there was uh, a less of this sense that accountability and the metrics of such um, were not interfering with the more intuitive mm -hmm. um, uh, academic concerns yeah. that uh, faculty members would have had? Yeah, era? I mean, I think honors is pretty much left alone. I mean, we never had a lot of people, I'm going to use this word advisedly, tampering with what we were trying to do in honors education. And as you alluded to a few moments ago, I mean, by the mid-1970s, we would branched out into having a, a required social science course, the family history class. We'd, As a result of having that, we added a, a pretty ambitious science class in bioethical decision-making that all students had to take. So we would branched out in the curriculum, and to do that kind of branching out, if you will, we had to hire, or hire, we weren't paying anybody anything, we had to get faculty who would agree to buy into teaching either small honors groups or in the case of the bioethical decision-making class or in the case of my family history class, teaching large numbers of students. Mm -hmm. Well, once you get to that, then you're bringing in a whole new different group of people as you begin to broaden the structural, the curricular structure of what you have to fulfill to graduate with an honors degree. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a real sea change. And that happens, oh, probably by the mid-1970s. Mm -hmm. um, but it goes back to your original question. If you're going to do that, you've got to have a new group of faculty. You've got to get them to buy into the whole concept of honors education on campus mm -hmm. and be sure that the standards that they're setting for their students are appropriate for honors credentialing. And, and it was never very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we were very lucky because we had people in the sciences who were willing to do that. And of course, the person teaching the social science until I became provost was me. And so after that, it's Tony Edmonds and Bruce Gielhood and various others mm -hmm. who were the ones who picked up that class after I became mm -hmm. vice president for academic affairs and provost. Mm -hmm. A conversation I had a week ago with uh, Dr. Uh, Grace Ledbetter, who's the director of the honors program at Swarthmore. Right. Uh, they're going to be hosting a field right. trip we're yeah. taking uh, in two weeks. Um, she mentioned that um, with their endowments, uh, they were able to bring in 10% of their admitted freshmen last year who are uh, first generation college students. Oh. And this single uh, year, uh, the campus has changed noticeably. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has uh, revivified uh, a debate which I'm noticing in some of the historical, the primary sources on Swarthmore's program, which is, uh, you know, without precedent yeah. in this era, right. uh, against um, this notion of elitism. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. and, um, Swarthmore it, being elite enough to begin with. Well, evidently it's among the top yeah. three most selective yeah. liberal yeah. arts colleges, yeah. and that's saying a lot because it it's got very good company. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so the question has to do with uh, returning to that uh, the thing right. that we talked about a moment ago, the Jeffersonian and Jacksonian mm -hmm. notion of democratic access right. uh, and uh, open enrollment and moving mm -hmm. from that era into the comprehensive university with higher admission standards today. Do you sense that, uh, or did you sense when you took over this program, that um, the fact that there was very little tampering was the result of benign neglect? People didn't know enough about what you were doing to really care to want a medal? Uh, yeah. Or was it seen as a way to um, perhaps bring some sense of elitism within a meritocracy mm -hmm. yeah. that said nothing about it. If you can come here and you know survive your freshman year, right. we will provide the tools in yeah. which you can become meritorious. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned that they had three opportunities to join the honors mm -hmm. uh, program that didn't have to be upon admission. Right. Right. So speak to this notion well, of the tension I think, between the meritocracy yeah, and the elitism. I, I think charges. it's both. I, th I think that it's it's, it's an opportunity for 
an institution still struggling with teachers' college evolving toward university mm -hmm. and what that really means. It, it's more giving students the opportunity to have some things that are not just part of their academic major. I mean, that's a really important part of honors because by and large, what you did in the honors college didn't have an awful lot to do with what you were majoring in. I mean, humanities may be for some English majors, uh, but beyond that, it might be a course or two. So I think it, I think it cuts both ways. I, I think that you have students who saw this as something that, and faculty as well, and maybe the larger academic community, as, as something that was indeed an elite within an institution that was hardly an elite institution in terms of its admission standards, retention standards. But it also was, I think, a small d democratic approach to giving people an opportunity. You want to try honors? Okay, you can try this curricular approach. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. Maybe it works for you, maybe it doesn't. It could be among the most rewarding, rich and rewarding things you do here as an undergraduate, and it may be awful. And there probably was a small number of students who indeed thought it was awful. You know, why, why do I don't want to read these great books? What do I want to bother with this stuff for? And so it, I almost sum it up by, by thinking of an accounting major who would say to me, well, you know, I'm going to go work for a large accounting firm. Uh, how is this going to help me? And I'll say, well, when you're, when you're helping me prepare, prepare my tax return, we could probably talk about some of the great books and the great ideas of the Western world. Now, that sounds silly, but to a lot of people in disciplines that are very narrow and structured like accounting, I'd say the same thing about architecture, but I think there's more breadth there. But you take an accounting major, and I always felt it was a great success to get a student who graduated with a degree in accounting and many of them went off to great and wonderful careers as far as financial rewards. But they would look back and say, well, but I took those honors classes and they really gave me a chance to expand my horizons you know, beyond a tax return or, or a corporate return or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I think going back to your original question, I think it cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. I think it, there is the elitist aspect to it, especially at a, a sort of people's college like Ball State. But there then is also the kind of leveling aspect to it that I think is, is equally important. It's never a bad idea to be able to talk to anybody about anything, right. in which case you need to be broadly educated yeah. as yeah. well as have deep knowledge yeah. of a subject area. Yeah. And I mention this to the ones, uh, the students that I have in my classes that, as you yeah. suggest, are, are narrowly focused yeah. and very you know, purposeful. Yeah. Sure. They're professionally oriented in, into yeah. a trade or a, a craft of some sort that you will get and retain business mm -hmm. by the ability to have a conversation that connects up with the deepest concerns that people have. Yeah. You have to know how to talk to them and to reach them at that mm -hmm. level and connect yeah. up their concerns about the mm -hmm. actuarial table right. if you're an accountant planning, you know, estate <laughs> planning or a lawyer or something. Well, actuarial is a good one because we had a lot of really what I would call some of my all-time great honor students major in actuarial science. So the point being that you have to be more than just somebody mm -hmm. who's proficient at a particular methodology, yeah. accounting, um, uh, legal yeah. matters. You have to deal with whole people mm -hmm. living in societies with complex problems. Yeah. And it's this broadening uh, experience mm -hmm. of an honors or liberal arts education that would give you the ability to find an entry point to whoever your client is or prospective mm -hmm. client if you're having to recruit and retain people. Well, and you, and you use the term academic breadth, and that's one of the things I used to really sell at honors orientation. When I would talk to mommy and daddy and Susie or Johnny mm -hmm. and say, well, you know, this is the academic breadth part of your education. Your accounting degree is narrowing deeper and deeper into the arcane aspects of tax accounting or cost accounting. What we want to do in the honors classes is stretch you out this way and to really focus on looking at things beyond more than a data set or something of that kind. Mm -hmm. You uh, mentioned last time that uh, you had, uh, I think you said a one hour um, uh, period during freshman orientation yeah. where you could make the pitch. <laughs> right. And so you've been giving us various yeah. uh, aspects of that. Yeah. And I made the uh, comment that you came from a line of entrepreneurs, so maybe <laughs> yeah, this uh, <laughs> way of selling it was actually bread in your bone. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but what, what yeah. are the other things, do you recall, uh, that was part of your standard uh, pitch to not only the student but to often their mother or parents, perhaps? Well, it, it was, going back to what I just said a few moments ago, mm -hmm. I think the academic breadth part was an important part of it. Mm -hmm. the, the other was the mundane, and that is you are coming here and you have to complete a general studies program. What honors education will offer you 
not in all of your general education courses, not in all your general studies classes, but in a few of them, an opportunity to do them differently. And so the humanities course will fulfill this part of your humanities requirement. The science course will fulfill part of your science requirement. The social science class and family history will require or fulfill this part of your, your social science requirement. So it was more giving them the opportunity to do some of their general studies in a different manner. What was scary, I think, to a lot of students and their, well, not their parents, really, students hearing it the first time, it's harder. And my pitch, and I always had, of course, a student with me to give the other, I would do a kind of administrator faculty pitch, student would give the I'm in the Honors College, here's what it's really like pitch. And then you get questions more to the student than to me. Well, is it harder? And I think that phrase that would come up again and again and again over 15 years was, it's not harder than, it's different than. And the approach the faculty member will take to the class is different than if you were taking recent American history with 200 people in a lecture class. Mm -hmm. And it is a sharp contrast to that. Mm -hmm. There is no real equivalent to the humanities course, to the great books course. And there you'll be looking at some of the great ideas that have molded and shaped the Western world primarily. So it was trying to get these students in a one-hour session <laughs> where by the end of it they had to fill out a card and say yes or no, which I refer to with my, shall we say, Protestant uh, ministerial background with my father, the altar call. And so at the end of the session, they'd all say, we have to decide now. Yeah, you got to decide right now because they were going to sign up for classes the next day. And so it was more in a contained one-hour pitch trying to get them to see this was an option, a different way of doing some of your general studies classes. Why not give it a shot? And that's basically all we said. And as a result, we'd get 90% positive returns on it. So of the number of students who were eligible of distinction group and orientation every day, we'd, we'd often run either oh, from 90 to 100% of the kids who were there. So we had a winning formula. And I think the combination was, was me and maybe my persuasiveness and having a student who had done this, had taken the classes, and usually a, an articulate young person, he or she, and they would articulate why they liked honors and why they thought the students should give it a shot. So it was never beyond at that point in time, because now they have this labyrinthian way of getting in it with filling out forms and things. With this, it was this one-shot deal, give it a try. And that was it. It was as simple as that. And I'm trying, I don't want to make this sound any more complex than it was because it wasn't. Looking back, uh, and given that you had experience uh, being coached and, and being a coach yeah. of athletics, do you think that there was <laughs> right. an aspect of that, of a sense that you can become more disciplined oh, sure. and superior? You will have to work. Well, I don't know about harder. superior. I, well, don't, I don't know if I go only that Only certain but... members make the team. Yeah, that okay. All and right, so I'll, there's I'll an ambition there. Yeah. They're not going to join the team if they don't yeah. think, if they're going to spend it yeah. all the time on the bench. Uh, yeah. So this notion that you have to convince them sure. that they have what it takes yeah. and then show them it's not impossible well, and give them an example of the student by your side yeah. that made it. Well, and then we had these fridge benefits. And we, I referred to those when we last spoke. And that is that they had the privilege of signing up for classes uh, before any other freshman. Mm -hmm. uh, that appealed to a few people. Mm -hmm. And they had these privileges they'd had for a long time over in the library where they could take books out for a whole year. Mm -hmm. Well, so there were little teeny things like that. Mm -hmm. I inherited the signing up early in the library thing. But there were a few people that liked that. Mm -hmm. um, but I still think it's, it's really more trying to persuade usually 20 to 25 students a day with mom and dad one or both parents there and say, you know, here is an academic experience that you might want to try. You may find that it's great and wonderful. It becomes one of the meaningful shaping influences of your undergraduate life here, or you may think it's awful. But you're not going to know unless you try. To that question, uh, the marketing aspect, the yeah. need to recruit, um, were you ever sensible of the fact that if you didn't make your mark, your, your numbers mm -hmm. uh, in a particular year, that oh. the program might be threatened <laughs> so that you're, you have a quota, essentially, we, no, we didn't a numbers. yield? No, no. We, we didn't have any numbers. I mean, I, you know, you'd get, oh, I don't know, maybe 150 incoming freshman students at that point mm -hmm. in time. I mean, yeah, 
honors, the total honors enrollment on campus, I guess at that time we'd count as about oh, 700 freshmen through senior, counting the fifth year architects. And this was when uh, Ball State's enrollment was maybe around 10,000? Oh, it's bigger than that. Bigger than, okay. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'd, say? I'd say about ah, 13, 14, but I'm okay. not really sure. Mm -hmm. um, but th those are the people we kept on the books. I'm laughing about this because going back to the secretary, we, we did all this stuff by hand. And so every student was a card. <laughs> so as we make up a card for you, then we'd check off when you finished the humanities class. We'd write in when you finished the colloquia, what your grade point was, as long as it wasn't below 3.25, uh, 3 you could stay on the program. You are eligible to take classes. But it was all done by hand. It's kind of the Bob Cratchit approach to keeping records. Uh, I have no idea how they do this now, but for the entire time I was up there until I left in the mid-1980s, it was all done by a couple of student assistants and one secretary. So the secretary by that time was a full-time secretary, but then we'd always have two or three honor students who were around there, and I, so I keep, keep up contact with some of them, and they'll talk about, you know, filling out the little cards by hand. So. I think of a, a change that's happened since that uh, era where the student ID number was the social security yeah, that's number. that's right. Yeah, that's and true. where student yeah. employees then would see the academic records of right. other students. Yeah, that's uh, right. And so the notion yeah. of a privacy right. uh, uh, was just not there <laughs> no, uh, no. as it would become later. Well, and especially yeah. when we got into the required student evaluations because then you'd have students who would come to the honors program office, later honors college, and go plowing through the evaluations that students who had proceeded Jane or Johnny, what they thought of Professor X, Y, or Z. So that, that went on for a period of time. So do you mean to say that the evaluations when they were first implemented actually had the student's name, the evaluator's name on the No, no no, 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 no. No, no, so those remained anonymous, yeah. but the professor's name. Yeah, professor's would, name. Would people, the students have done that in order to uh, figure out who they yeah. wanted to take classes with? So yeah. they were ambitious enough to do research well, worked with it, well, it, on, say, it, who they take a colloquium with. For well, no, well, yeah, to some degree. They'd say, well, what, I'm thinking of taking colloquium X. Mm -hmm. How'd the students like it last year? Mm -hmm. uh, it probably was more with the faculty teaching the humanities class because there were different approaches to teaching the great books. And so sometimes they come in to see, well, does this person emphasize written work more than, say, oral commentary in discussion sections or something like that? So you, you'd get a little bit of that. Perks. You yeah. mentioned a couple of them. Yeah, right. Was it under your directorship where the idea of forming sort of a community of students residing oh, together yeah. uh, in a, yeah. uh, uh, one of the dorms? Yeah. Was that an idea that you had? And if no, so, that's a student idea. Okay, but when did it come into place under uh, your directorship? Early, let's see, probably by the mid-1970s. Okay, so you were, uh, you were in charge oh, then. Yeah, they yeah. brought the idea to you. Yeah, they, they came over to see me one day and said, you know, we have a great idea. I can still remember the, because I know the student. Who is it? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a student who's now a uh, Franciscan priest, uh, whose name is Michael Sarufka, and did a law degree when he left here, Whitinger Scholar, uh, in the first Whitinger class, then went on and uh, joined the Franciscan Order. For a time, he had this wonderful job where he was the Franciscan's representative to the United Nations in New York City. Last time I saw him, he was a parish priest in a Polish-American area of Cleveland. Uh, but he was the first person that I remember vividly said, could we talk to you about honors housing? And I said, what do you mean honors housing? And he said, well, do you think there would be an opportunity for honors students to live in part of, key point, a residence hall? And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I, do you think it's a good idea? I'll be glad to talk to people about that. And by great contrast with how easy it was to get the Whitinger Scholars Program approved, this was the opposite because the people who were in charge of housing at Ball State were adamantly opposed to doing it. And they did not want to have any special residence halls. And the person who ran that was a person who actually had a doctoral degree in housing. There is such a thing. Well, I didn't know there was, but the fellow's <laughs> name was Welker Bishop. And Welker Bishop called me in and said, I want you to know I'm going to oppose this. And he said, the reason I'm going to oppose it is if we let you have special housing for honors, the next people in the door are going to be the athletic coaches, and they'll all want athletic dorms, and I'm totally opposed to that. Well, that never came to pass. But when Dr. Bishop said this to me, I said, okay, I've got a bunch of students that want to do this. I'm just telling you I'm going to do it. And I'm going to talk to Dean Lawhead, Vice President Burkhart, President Pruce, 
and see if we can get this done because I think it would be a good attracting point for students coming on campus. Again, an option. We have honors housing. If you want to live there, fine. If you don't, you don't have to live there. Well, by the end of all of this, going back and forth, all the senior administrative people approved of it over Dr. Bishop, and we were given the right to, at a year at a time, back in the 1970s, add honors to what was then the Johnson Complex, Botsford Swinford Hall. And so that's how honors housing came about. And so we put freshman honor students into a residence hall that had non-honors sophomores, juniors, and seniors, which is a little bit edgy for a while. But by the time he got to the sophomore year and you had about as many honor students in there as non-honor students, the students who didn't want to be around the honor students all moved out. And so within a four-year period, we had taken over the, the uh, Botsford Swinford Hall and had the first ever honors mm -hmm. housing on this campus. Mm -hmm. You know that one of my areas of specialization is communitarianism. Mm -hmm. yeah, and right. uh, in the uh, colloquium that I teach for the Honors College on American Communal Utopias, I place great emphasis on monasteries <laughs> and how religious groups yeah. wanting to live together to foster this fellow mm -hmm. feeling yeah. and a sense of egalitarianism is a really important part of what mm -hmm. you know, get, leaves the yeah. religious uh, sector and sure. moves into the secular. So I think that's fascinating yeah. that the, the lead person here was somebody who then becomes... David Franciscan uh, priest, yeah. yeah. with that tradition. Well, but also, it, it, it you was have fraternities and uh, sororities yeah. as a way to build right. relationships, yeah. athletic teams and in involvement, people within mm -hmm. majors taking classes with right. one another. So well, you now know, you have all that. I mean, now you have mm -hmm. special interest residence halls all over the place. Well, that's but right. So that once point, again, you were first at, at this. At that point, except for the fraternity houses off campus, the sorority suites on campus, they never had houses off campus, this was it. I mean, so the, the first group to do this, and as I said, they were the ones who wanted to do it, were the honors college students. Could you detect a change in uh, honors student culture, if we can call it that, uh, in the period after uh, the students had the option to yeah. live in the honor store? Yeah, they did a lot, of, a lot more things together. There mm -hmm. was a lot more camaraderie. There was a lot more identification with being in the honors college. Uh, Botsford Swinford was right next to Carmichael Hall. That's where I taught the honors course that I had. Even though the honors office was on the far south end of campus, mm -hmm. I had a kind of an auxiliary office on the far north end of campus in the Carmichael building. And so I had an office right next to where the students were. I mean, it was, it was never the best situation, and nothing on this campus pertaining to honors education was ever the best until they have what they have now, with a combination of the residence halls across from the Ball Honors House. So, I mean, they, they've got the best that they could ever hope to have right now. The period of time I was there and my successors, up before Jim Rubel became dean, they were, you know, we moved all over campus. But the ultimate goal from day one of honors education was to have honors in the center of campus. And that never happened until they got the house and the remodeled sorority suites. Mm -hmm. Well, that's utterly fascinating. Yeah, and it is, yeah. Would you say that uh, in some respects the uh, development of honors housing uh, was sort of a proof of concept then for the learning community sure. approach that uh, resident life uh, takes now? Uh, yeah, except at the time when we had the Honors Residence Hall, you had something called the Carmichael Residential Instruction Project. And Bruce Gillard for a time was the director of that. Oh, tell me more about that. Oh, that was a freshman-sophomore program that was centered in the residence halls out there where, where La Follette, you know, the ones that are coming down now. I mean, they had, a, they had a residential instruction program where students took a couple of classes in the Carmichael program and a couple of classes outside of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was... Honors began to become, to be blunt, the lead dog on the sled. And when Jim Cook became provost here, he shut down the whole Carmichael program. So it lasted until the early 1980s. What was uh, his rationale behind closing it down? He just think it wasn't important having it anymore because you already had honors out there. And there wasn't, he didn't seem to think there was any more demand to have mm -hmm. another kind of special mm -hmm. freshman, sophomore program out there. Okay. Did you mean that when you use the term about the residential portion, uh, that a faculty member actually resided in the same no. building? No. no. Had that ever been tried? No. The, the, you had faculty who had offices out there. Just offices, but so, no faculty member actually had an apartment no. within a dormitory no, where they understood. No. The faculty had offices in the Carmichael building. Yes. And as I said, the students took a couple of classes there and a couple on the, in Carmichael and a couple mm -hmm. on campus. Mm -hmm. And that lasted, oh, probably for about seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. 
in looking through uh, the documents in the uh, Honors College Collection, University Archives, and your personal right. papers, uh, we came across uh, this uh, catalog or directory or handbook uh, for honors education, which seems to coincide with about when you took over, about 1970. <laughs> I guess uh, so, since my picture's there, so I, think, I guess that's true. There's a reference as to what's going to be going on with the fall quarter of, of 1970, oh, yeah. so it looks like it was prepared for, yeah. for that. And uh, the uh, table of contents is a, a snapshot of the curriculum that was evolving oh, yeah, at the yeah. point that, that you took over. I was curious if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the specific courses. So you alluded to, um, which uh, I think it was then called the ID, maybe 199. Yeah, that's a family history now. class. Right, and when I, I inherited that course from right. Dick Aquila, uh, who was our department chair in history, uh, when he was hired away by uh, Penn State, I um, was told that it was family history, and that's the way that Tony Edmonds and Bruce right. Gill had taught it. But uh, Dick Aquila was teaching it as uh, American culture in the 60s. Right. That was his approach, so that's what I did. Yeah. I've always had a, a, a component in one of the writing assignments to do an oral history project uh, that typically is satisfied by interviewing a family member who was alive and aware in the mm -hmm. 1960s to talk about how their personal lives intersected or did not with the larger trends that were going on. But was that a course that you helped to design, or was that in place uh, when you were hired here? At, uh, uh, no, I, I designed it. Okay, and, and so it's, tell, it's, tell us about what was behind that. Well, then. it's because I, I began to be very interested in family history mm -hmm. in the 1970s, and I, the, I wanted to have a class where all of the first-year students would get to know me and I'd get to know them, mm -hmm. which is very atypical honors because what it meant on quarters is you took the freshman honors group and divided into thirds. So if you take the number 70, very non-honors number, there were 70 students in the fall, 70 in the winter, 70 in the spring. And then I had about nine or 10 student discussion leaders who had taken the course previously, whom I just called DLs, discussion leaders. And they met with the students in smaller groups once a week, kind of like having a large lecture class with TAs. Mm -hmm. um, the first year I taught it, you'll get a kick out of this part of it, I didn't teach it as family history. It was one of the great disasters of my life. I taught it as American character. Right, and which I, is a big thing within the American Studies right. movement at that era. And the author of the text was Michael McGifford, who had been one of my mentors in graduate school. And he had just published a book on the character of Americans. I used his book, and this is, these are first year Ball State freshmen. It was awful. I mean, they, the, the reading was tough. It was very, very difficult to get across the concept of American character. The students who were first year Ball State freshmen never had any contact with this concept before. So about halfway through that first year, I decided this is awful. And the evaluations of the class were, oh, kind of mixed. And I decided I was gonna change the whole structure for the following year and ran across a book by two professors at CCNY called Generations, Your Family in American History. And it was a collection of readings using a family history approach with workbook sheets at the end on how to do your family history. And I thought, yep, that's what I'm gonna do. And that's how it changed. And so from the first year of American character to the second year on forever till the present day, although it's done differently by different faculty members now, but when I taught it, and when Tony Edmonds taught it, it was a very traditional family history course in that you had to do a family history. And so, so that was my period of time from, oh, the mid-1970s till I became provost in the mid-1980s where I read hundreds of family histories. Tony then continued that, and, and Tony and I used to look upon that as one of the great highlights of our time at Ball State. I mean, I still, to this day, run into people in town, on campus, and I know what they wrote for their family history. You know, some other faculty members here toss off a name like Laura Helms. I still remember her family history. Uh, I still remember Beth Dalton's family history. There's an eminent, well, attorney in town now on the school, school board named Mark Irvin. I still remember Mark Irvin's family history. So there are a whole bunch of these things that I still recall. Uh, the beauty of doing family history for me, and I'm being very selfish about this, is with 70 students in the class, you had 70 different stories. And so on quarters, I had to read these at the end of the semester, grade them, and get the grading of the students done. And so 
I had this stack of 70 family histories, and they were all over the place. You know, even though a lot of them were rural Indiana, even though a lot of them educated me, a New York City kid, on what it took to know what hog prices were in the 1950s in Indiana, all of them were different. And though there may have been some categorizations of rural, urban, suburban, you name it, and even though 90% of them may have been Hoosier stories, they were still different. Mm -hmm. And so I, I often would joke and say, if they'd all had to write a paper on the character of Americans, you'd go nuts. Mm -hmm. With my case, it was reading 70 different stories. And that's why a lot of them have stayed with me. So I mean, that was the evolution of why the class became family history. It's fascinating to think in the context of the 70s, of the bicentennial era, right. the great uh, interest in oh, connecting yeah. the local history with right. the national past, yeah. but also the publication of Roots by Alex sure. Haley, which yeah. then led to this vogue for yeah. genealogy, yeah. sort of moved it out of, this yeah. is what you know, people yeah. with pedigrees did to prove their membership for eligibility mm -hmm. for DAR to everybody right. had a family history that was fascinating. And if you had the, um, mm -hmm. the access to the sources and were oh, persnickety yeah. and wanted to learn the technique, yeah. you could uncover what mm -hmm. never before was really dwelt on by most uh, people that weren't from the elite background. Well, in the way that I set up the class, I had a guest person come in each week. And so even though I would talk about the southwestern Michigan Dutch immigrant experience. I would then bring in Arno Wittig, who later became the dean of the college, and he would talk about growing up in a German-American household in Buffalo, New York, with an aunt who was absolutely sure that Hitler was gonna take over the United States and belong to the German-American Bund. And so, and I would bring in Hurley Goodall to talk about the African-American experience in Middletown. Uh, I would bring in a senior law partner at the firm of Defer Varan, Reed Varan, who grew up in this little teeny town in Kansas and went from Pretty Prairie, Kansas to the Harvard Law School. So I mean, every week I'd bring in somebody with a different perspective. I'd bring in Tony Edmonds to talk about growing up in the segregated South. In Mississippi. Exactly, so also in that 10 week quarter, they had eight different people talk about different family perspectives while they themselves were going through the process of doing a family history. So we made them all historians, <laughs> amateurs, for a quarter. Mm -hmm. And they, there was some value added there to the yeah. families because many families did not have family historians right. or genealogists and right. that may have you know, started well, something. And, and it gets you into a lot of funny things. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I never for once considered, when I set this up as the research requirement for the class, doing a family history, all of a sudden I recall the first one who came to me and said, I'm adopted. I recall the first person who came to me, I kid you not, and said, I don't speak to my parents. Uh, so that you began to have all these little variables where I would say to people, in the case of the person who said, I haven't spoken to my parents in 15 years, invent your family. So you uh, gave them the opportunity to do a fictitious exactly, family yeah. history. That's what I did. Oh, and that's so, fascinating. So you, you had to be open enough that when someone came to you with, I cannot do a traditional, one, at least one side of the family, three generational family history, well then what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. so, and there was a lot of it was trauma. And you know, I, I recall a student coming to me and saying, my father took his life six months ago and I just am not gonna do this. And so once again, you had to be creative enough to say, then you've gotta come up with an invented family. Mm -hmm. And they were very willing to do that. But it was just you always in a group of 70 students would have four or five people that would mm -hmm. come to you. And you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of and just say, mm -hmm. I'm really gonna have problems with this, why? And they'd tell you one of these reasons. Given that your uh, interest and fascination included the recent past and yeah. eyewitnesses to uh, right. that history, and as an oral historian, right. um, you uh, were assimilated to this, did you find that it was quite unusual to be teaching a class that was in part inviting guest presenters in on a regular basis to essentially share the position <laughs> right. of authority uh, as though they were parallel to the yeah. faculty member? No, I wanted to give them different dimensions. I mean, my, but did my, anybody else do that at that time? No. How'd you come up with the idea? I just thought that it was important for them to have different perspectives while they were going through the process of molding and shaping a 20-page paper on their own pass mm -hmm. up to age 18. Um, and obviously, you didn't mind sharing the authority with somebody brought no, in. No, no, and I and you know I, I'm a great believer in the richness of people you find in a community like Muncie. When I think of the contrast between a Hurley Goodall 
and growing up as an African-American, working class, blue collar, Muncie, Indiana, and Reed Varand, who by then was a very wealthy senior partner at Defer Varand, growing up in this little teeny town in rural Kansas and going to the Harvard Law School and being in the FBI during World War II, ferreting out Nazis that I'd say, well, maybe they were after Arno Zant or something like that, so who knows? You may know that Bruce Gilhood continues this approach yeah, in uh, Honors 199 today, and I don't know if yeah. any other faculty do. No, I think he's the only one. And mm -hmm. Tony Edmonds and I joke about that in emails and say that, that when Bruce retires, that the, the traditional way of doing this course will be over. But my point is, the course gave people like you and you know, Tim Berg, Jason Powell, all the people who teach it now, enough breadth that you can come at it from a whole bunch of different angles. Mm -hmm. I always make sure there's a way that you can get the family angle yeah, in right. somehow. And sure. given the generation gap yeah. of the 1960s era, it's hard to avoid. <laughs> right. But what I'm finding is that uh, in the 20 years that I've been doing it, they're, um, they're no longer interviewing their parents. They're interviewing their grandparents yeah, and even great-grandparents yeah. to get right. somebody that was alive and aware of the yeah. 1960s era. No, that's right. <laughs> True. Yeah. Look at this uh, uh, directory or catalog uh, or handbook from the 1970 period and tell me some more about the uh, transition to a more uh, diverse, uh, complex uh, curriculum than the one that uh, was, um, I mean, you brought a sense, like you mentioned a moment ago, uh, the sciences uh, into uh, the required core. Yeah. And I know that you've alluded to this in an uh, uh, off-camera uh, interview that we had mm -hmm. uh, last month. Uh, tell me more about your attempts to broaden out the curriculum, and in, in particular about the science uh, course. Well, I think that's the key one. I mean, I think there was never any difficulty getting people in the social sciences and the humanities to mm -hmm. buy into doing honors. Mm -hmm. the, the big leap forward, if you will, was getting into, I used to joke because the building, of course, is there, Cooper Science and trying to find people who would be willing to commit their time and energy to working only with honor students. Mm -hmm. And I think as we've talked in a previous conversation, had it not been for Tom Mertens and John Hendricks, who came forward with the uh, science class that was bioethical decision making, a research area of great interest to both of them, especially John Hendricks, uh, I'm not sure we ever would have pulled it off. I mean, I. I really didn't know how to do this. And so when you think of traditional introductory courses in chemistry and physics, biology, you name it, I wanted to find some way where there was a different orientation to this that would have some intellectual breadth to it by my measure. And when I began talking to Tom Merton's senior faculty member, John Hendricks, more of a junior faculty member to Tom in terms of age, they started talking to me about what do you think about this this is not a lab class, it's what we're working on, and it really is, in the, large, the largest context, bioethical decision making. I said, well, that sounds like a pretty good idea to me. And the course was incredibly good in the way they went about it, the amount of time and energy they put into it, and it really became, for both of them, for a large part of their academic careers here, what they really identified with on, in the larger academic community, but certainly in the Honors College. I mean, the Honors College never could have had the science requirement or any kind of science requirement that I think was as good as that one because that was such an all-inclusive way of looking at the, the way scientists ask mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. And so they put that class in. It became a very, very popular class. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of rounded out the entire curricular structure mm -hmm. of honors offerings on campus. Now, I would digress and say one other thing that we did, although it never became all that popular, we also in the 1970s and on to the early 80s put in departmental honors. And so we said to departments, if you don't like what we're doing with our liberal arts orientation, why don't you come up with something else? Whereby a student majoring in department X or Y or Z could do some courses, some work within the major, but just the major, and graduate with departmental honors. And we kind of oversee that. Well, we did it for a while. I'm not so sure there's any of that that still goes on, but we tried to encourage departments to do some honors. Mm -hmm. 
but we don't really want to do some of this liberal arts kind of stuff. We'll do something else. Well, okay, well, what do you want to do? Well, we'll come up with something that will enable journalism student A or TCOM student B to do honors within TCOM, within journalism. And a lot of other universities were taking that approach. I picked it up from going to national honors conferences, regional honors conferences. It was never a roaring success here, but I know some schools have been very successful doing that. We probably weren't. The core of honors here still remains the core curriculum. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the key piece to making it a well-rounded core curriculum was adding the science class, mm -hmm. no question. Mm -hmm. Now I know they've also added non-Western world classes and things of that kind mm -hmm. that, are, that are part of the curricular structure, but that came a little bit after me, so mm -hmm. I'm not that familiar with it. The science course was the real key to mm -hmm. what you're talking about here. Well, I'm struck by how the ethics is a branch of philosophy, yeah, and that brings right. the humanities back yes, into the mix yes. with the science yeah. and to show that they yeah. you can't really have the one without the other. They right. have to inform yeah. one another. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. in the liberal arts, the goal is to try to get people to think about how the disciplines do support yeah. one another and provide a prismatic yeah. way of in analyzing uh, social problems, for example. Yeah, and I think that, that that from day one was probably what the honors program, later honors college core, mm -hmm. core curricular structure was after to try to have something that is that there's a core there. Well, if you don't have the science class, you don't have a core. You gotta find some way to do that. Mm -hmm. And I you know, I know I'm really belaboring this, but it's so important to have these two faculty members step forward and say, okay, we have a class th that we think will really address this. And they did, and it became a really well-known class, but it added that one missing link that you had to have to have a required core across the spectrum of general studies. Did they team teach it or yeah. each had a section? Oh, they took yeah, it. Was it three credit hours well, I, or six? I never went to their class, I must confess. It, it was it was like the others. It was a four and then a three. And so it was four on quarters and then three when we switched to semesters. Okay, and um, so this notion of loading now, you think yeah, that right. everybody has to have a 4-4 four, four load yeah, unless yeah, they're doing research yeah. that it's 3-3. Three, three, right, right. And what constitutes, uh, you know, rising to a sufficiency right. of 10 minimum uh, students in uh, yeah. uh, FTEs and, like, again, yeah, the whole accounting right. notion. Um, so was this something that there was any pushback by department chairs or the Dean of College of Sciences? Or well, I'm so not, not to really? the point where I ever had a conversation okay. about it. I mean, we just simply took it. It's, it's a class. Was it a class with a couple hundred students in it? I'm not sure how they divided it up. I think okay. it, was, it was probably much like, um, like the family history class where you had, you had a large group of students and broke them up into small discussions. Okay, sessions. but maybe 70 who yeah. came to lecture and then discussion, yeah. they broke into smaller yeah. groups. Okay, yeah. so yeah, that, and that, and, you know, that's funny because that, mm -hmm. that's pretty atypical honors. When you think of honors, mm -hmm. you think of small. Right, exactly. You don't think of having 70 people. Mm -hmm. um, but that only lasted through the time I was doing it. By the time Tony got to taking the class, we'd cut it down to multiple sections. In my case, I only had one you're now talking about 199. Yeah, but okay. see, the same mm -hmm. thing with bioethical decision making. You had mm -hmm. to find some way to have a large, larger lecture context and then break it down to small discussion groups. Mm -hmm. Are there any other uh, contributions during your directorship of the Honors College Honors Program that we haven't addressed that you'd like to make sure got entered into uh, the historical record? Well, I mean, it, it, it's funny because I become provost in the mid 1980s and some of the things that we continued to do after that, when Arno Wittig, then Bruce Meyer, and then following his passing, Arno Wittig again, um, and then that's at the point Jim Rubel was, was hired was about the time I, ret uh, was, I retired. The other dimension we haven't talked about is we began getting into international programs. And so we began sending students and uh, some honors faculty to Oxford which is a really atypical thing. And so we had gotten to know uh, a scholar at Westminster College where we originally sent students and faculty. And then he- Originally being what year approximately? This would have been, I was the first person to go there, 1983, 84. And so we did honors at Oxford probably for about a decade and a half. And when Jim Rubel took over, it became very expensive. And so there really was no way to continue. And so we, we stopped it. Um, but for a long period of time, we had honors college students who were enrolled at an Oxford college. Perhaps and 12 that, or so a year? Uh, I'm not, really not sure. I don't think it was there were that many. I think okay. it was probably far fewer than that. 
But you took them and you taught classes there. Well, that was, uh, Tony, yeah, the, the faculty who took them over there, then it was about, that probably would have been eight or nine or ten students. I, okay. I, I go back on that because when they were going to Westminster College, Oxford, there probably would have been ten or a dozen students. Um, and the Goffmans took people over there and Bruce Meyer took people over there and Wade Jennings and Tony and Joanne Edmonds. Um, then the program switched into the colleges of the university itself at West, or excuse me, at Manchester College, now, it's, now Harris Manchester. Mm -hmm. And that was much more expensive, so we could only afford to send a couple students over there. Mm -hmm. And then Jim Rubel phased out the program. But I mean, I, I talk about that because we were the only mid-sized public university in the United States that had a program at the University of Oxford. How in the world did you make that happen? You had a connection? Yeah, One the, person the, helped yeah, facilitate yeah, it? Yeah, the connection, the connection was a person who was a historian and a chaplain at Westminster College, Oxford, a separate Methodist college. Mm -hmm. He then became the principal of one of the Oxford colleges, Manchester, and then Harris Manchester. And it was totally through his mm -hmm. having control over who gets admitted to his college mm -hmm. that he said, well, why don't you send some students from Ball State's Honors College? What was his name? Ralph, uh, blank his last name now. Oh, well, it'll, it'll come to me. Okay. Yeah. And was this Ralph, somebody you hit? Ralph, 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 Ralph. Oh, okay. Okay. Was this somebody that you had met? Yeah, uh, I met him at, at Westminster College. Oh, okay. Yeah, when and we first went over there in 1983-84. Ralph Waller, W-A-L-L-E-R. Very good. Good fellow. <laughs> Terrific recall. Yeah. I don't know how you do it. Instantaneous. <laughs> Clean living. Yeah. <laughs> and regular exercise. And let's hope plenty of sleep. <laughs> True. <laughs> So this experience, yeah. uh, Oxford provided housing? Uh, yeah, the students all lived on campus, yeah, yeah. And so we just took their tuition that they paid here and transferred it over there. And that was sufficient? They accepted uh, all state tuition? Well, the because amount. Because our tuition would have been so yeah. low compared the, to Yeah, the, the amount, it was kind of a clean wash, if you will. Oh. Yeah. And that worked okay until we decided... Once you got into the regular University of Oxford, then it was a whole different story. Right. And keep in mind that we were not only just sending students over there, we were sending faculty over there. And that lasted... Two per time? Uh, one one or two? Oxford. Because Tony and Joanne, I know, both yeah. taught when they went over. Yeah, right? Oxford's on quarters. And so I was there a couple of times in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a number of other faculty from here who went there, usually in the fall term or the spring term, because mm -hmm. the calendars don't coincide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would say probably one term. An Oxford term is, they, they're only eight weeks long, so mm -hmm. they're very short periods of time. So you've got to play around with the calendar a little bit. Did the students take other courses there besides the ones the faculty taught? They took some courses offered by the faculty that we sent over there with them, and they took some from Oxford faculty. And were those yeah. courses not taught on the tutorial basis? They, they were, but tutorial over there uh, is not totally one-on-one. -on -one. Tutorials can be one on three, one on four. Okay, so something like a discussion yeah. section. Yeah, yeah, more like a discussion setting. Yeah, okay. I, I would say. Sign readings, you come and you talk yeah. with the uh, uh, right. per preceptor. Yeah. Or, uh, so yeah, with, your, with your don, <laughs> with uh -huh. your, the person who's in charge of your academic program. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, again, I go back to the point that we were the only mid-sized public university to have a program over there. There were lots of people over there from Bowdoin and... Uh, you know, Bates and Trinity and Wesleyan and Harvard, Yale and Princeton and Stanford, but there were no mid-sized public universities represented at all, except us. And again, where did you get the idea that such a thing would even be possible? Well, the idea started out with a meeting that Jim Cook, when he was provost here, had with the gentleman who was the principal at Westminster College, Oxford. And they met at a dinner everything's done over dining and eating or drinking in Oxford. And he talked about being at Ball State University, you know, they might be interested in having some students there. And the principal uh, of Westminster College said, well, yeah, why don't you send somebody over? And the somebody happened to be me. So I was the first one that went there in 1983, 84. And as I said, we had the program until the early years of this century. 
I noticed in uh, looking through your papers that uh, you created a course called uh, America in the Eyes of the Brits. Oh, it's yeah. one of the courses that you taught there. Do you yeah. re remember uh, what the curriculum uh, constituted, primary sources? Uh, no, it was, it was primarily talking to, I just finished the Middletown Film Project. That's right. important. Okay, 1980s. And right. so I, I used the films in the Middletown Film Project to show to about 15 British students and get their response to it. So it was uh, films based on aspects of life in good old Middletown mm -hmm. and having these kids from all over the United Kingdom respond to these movies, these mm -hmm. documentary films mm -hmm. that we made about Muncie, Indiana. I see. So that's pretty much Did you also it. assign uh, either of the first two Middletown studies so that they Pieces. understood the categories? Each had a one hour documentary. Yeah, I did, I, we, cause getting the, a life. Well, because uh, the documentary. Yeah, because yeah, the films follow the, the, the six parts mm -hmm. that the lens broke Middletown in for mm -hmm. purposes of study. Mm -hmm. And so I gave them the films and showed them how we had come up with these ideas. Mm -hmm. Some good and some not so good. Mm -hmm. Since you've raised that, I, I, I can't resist the temptation to ask you about um, you and Joe Trimmer and others yeah. help facilitate right. Dwight uh, Hoover. The, uh, Dwight Hoover, yeah. uh, the, the visit to campus for right. the filmmakers. They were here for quite a while and did right. uh, fascinating. It's just a, yeah. uh, a time capsule for right. a particular era. Um, one of the films, famously, was considered too controversial right. for being broadcast over yeah. our public television yeah, station. 17. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? I know this is tangential yeah. to uh, the honors, uh, but it also gives us some insight yeah. into the era. Well, each of the films was done by a, a, a different filmmaker, although Peter a Davis ended up doing two of them as far as being the, the person directing the film. Uh, he hired other directors he knew to make the others. He hired a boyfriend-girlfriend, uh, really, uh, to do the film on education. And the film on education was done at Southside High School, the one that is now, well, was the title mm -hmm. of it was 17. Mm -hmm. And the approach that these two young people took was one much like the Lynn's coming here of participant observation. Mm -hmm. And what Joel Krinas and Joey DeMott, Joel He, Joey She, kind of moved into the south side of Muncie and beginning in an academic year in the fall and September, pretty much lived at Southside High School and outside of Southside High School, filming the lives of this one small group of kids. Um, and since those interactions included interracial dating, smoking pot, this is now the late 1970s, early 80s, uh, there were lots of concerns raised when the final cut of the film was shown to the people uh, at PBS. Uh, Peter Davis was asked to withdraw the film from the six films that were going to be shown. Peter Davis said he wouldn't do that. PBS asked him, or well, was it was it not the public broadcasting system yeah. that asked him? They were the ones that did. Yeah, Larry, oh. the, the fellow who was in charge died recently. Uh, Larry, I blank on his last name okay. too, and so Peter said he wasn't going to withdraw the film. They wanted him to pull it, and he wouldn't do that, and so they pulled it. So what was to be a six part examination, documentary film examination of Muncie as a nation's middle town became a five part examination. And that film as a result took on a life of its own. And so it wasn't shown for a very long period of time. The interesting thing that you might like to know is that when I went over to Oxford in the fall of 83, the film was shown in the London Film Festival. And so here I am as one of the academic humanists who worked as a consultant on this project in Oxford, England, with all these academics, people interested in the history of film, and they're saying, you worked on this project in this banned film that's going to be shown at the London Film Festival? There I was, my moment of fame. And so I had all kinds of people asking me about, you know, kind of the question you asked, how did this happen? Why was it so controversial? Mm -hmm. It would obviously not be controversial today, but then it was seen in this part of the country by the school board, by the people in the community who didn't want it shown. And so it was never shown on the Ball State campus until about, I don't know, 2006 or mm -hmm. 2007. Well, now. that's fascinating because I had always uh, 
assume that Ed Ball had something to do with why it wasn't shown. No. He, he personally, no. because he was the one that actually no. helped us get the uh, PBS station yeah, no, affiliate he, for here. Ed, Ed was it a had very, nothing to do with that. No, Ed, oh, Ed was a very good friend of mine, and I can assure you he had nothing to do personally, nor did his wife Virginia, with that film not being shown. It was more the school board and the senior administrators of the Muncie Community Schools mm -hmm. and their attorneys. Well, and now you've added another wrinkle to it, that it was the PBS uh, broadcasting well, officials. that's national. That, uh, and the, yes, and the, and exactly. The, I didn't know there was any national controversy Oh no, 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 I thought no, it was all no. local. Well, the president's name was Larry Grossman. I just thought of that. Ah. And, and Larry Grossman said to Peter Davis, are you going to withdraw the film? And Peter said no. And so he said, well, we're, not, we're going to withdraw. It's not going to be shown. Interesting. Was there any reaction when you showed this to your students uh, at Oxford? You mentioned that that was part of how the class was constructed. I mean, did they see the controversy? Uh, yeah, I think so. But, you know, college students are college students. These are seniors in high school. Uh, they, they kind of thought it was quite humorous, actually. Kids driving around Muncie smoking pot, like no one ever does that in London uh, or Oxford. Uh, the racial part of it, I think, they found a little more interesting. I mean, they... What, what Grossman wanted Peter to do was to cut out three or four scenes. And one of the scenes was a very blonde girl, an African-American boy, in a lingering kiss at a county fair. And I use that as a case in point. They wanted that pulled. Uh, they wanted a couple of scenes with the pot smoking and driving around Southside Muncie. They wanted that pulled. And they just, the filmmakers, Joel Krinas and Joey DeMott weren't going to pull it. Peter deferred to the filmmakers, I'm not going to pull it. And so they said, no, then we'll just pull the whole film. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, 17 took on a life of its own. Probably seen by more people program. because of the And I was the honors program director while this was going on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so did some notoriety accompany you back to uh, yeah. the Ball State campus? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, except that there were some influential people in positions of economic power mm -hmm. in the community who certainly let me know that they thought I was giving the community a black eye and that I should not have anything to do with this project. Mm -hmm. We were uh, proceeding from the question about, uh, was there anything else about your time at the head of the Honors Program, Honors College, that right. we hadn't well done? So I'm really glad that you brought up the yeah, uh, right. Oxford connection because that was a, yeah. a really big development. And as you say, it no longer yeah. is a, a right. part of the uh, uh, educational right. offerings uh, that we have. You've mentioned um, the Whitinger Scholars as a uh, really important uh, development. Again, it was right. something that um, helped to exemplify an observation that you made last time and then also with our uh, off-campus uh, discussions about this project that there was very little opposition to any of the ideas mm -hmm. that you brought. Right. Uh, surprisingly, uh, given how difficult it is to do new things at Ball State today, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think has changed from that period in the 70s and 80s where there was more receptivity uh, to innovation in some respects uh, and less top-down impediments to creativity mm -hmm. that bubble up from the lower ranks uh, to the present? Well, not very many people at that point in time were doing things like this, and so it wasn't that you had... 27 faculty who were vying to get A, B, C, and D. Um, honors was new. There was a kind of freshness to it. Uh, I think there was a view that we were sort of staking out some turf that mm -hmm. other public universities were not doing, especially in this part of the country. Um, so I, I think there was a, a receptivity to coming up with a lot of ideas that were seen as being to the benefit of a very important part of students, a mm -hmm. part of the student body. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to have more students like this on campus, then we've got to be aggressive in the manner in which we go out offering scholarships, curricular structure, off-campus opportunities mm -hmm. to this cadre of students. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I had something good to sell. And what I was selling was We've got really good faculty teaching these people. They're very interested in working with them. But the students as a group are just a terrific group of young people. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to push that forward, now I think you've got lots of people with lots of different agendas in the more bureaucratic university structure that you speak of. This was not a very bureaucratic university structure. It was quite open. Uh, it was quite fluid. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you had not gotten into capital fundraising. And so this was pretty atypical to do things like this and to ask to do things like this. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a time in Ball State's history, as I look back, as I told Bruce and they're doing the history of Ball State, where if you had some good ideas and you had the courage of your convictions to push those ideas forward, the chance of getting them implemented were pretty good. Mm -hmm. So let's take another idea that yeah. you originated during that period of time that seems to coincide with this change from the uh, teacher uh, model to the right. scholar-teacher model. Right. Uh, you're now attracting people from uh, top-ranked uh, research universities that probably would right. never have come to a Ball State Teachers College for the most part. They would have expected to go on to other right. um, high uh, uh, productive uh, research institutions like they came out of uh, graduate school right. programs. Uh, the is there a link between the establishment uh, under your initiative of the Honors Undergraduate Fellow uh, oh, and the yeah. teacher-scholar uh, model, scholar-teacher model, where you have people that are now doing programs of research yeah. and looking for undergraduates, not graduate students, mm -hmm. with the, the Honors Undergraduate yeah. Fellow program, uh, that, do those co-evolve? Yeah, you know, it's funny, I, I hadn't even thought about that. I mean, yeah, we, we began the Undergraduate Fellows Program. Mm -hmm. um, so that's 1982, around yeah. the time that you did the Whitinger Scholars. Yeah, I mean, we, and we did the Undergraduate Fellows Program as a lot of the doctoral programs, like the one in our own department in history, got tossed to the rubbish heap. You know, I'm still not sure that was a great idea, but Jim Cook said we're going to do it, so you know, that's the way it happened. Um, but the Undergraduate Fellowship Program really came out of, okay, if we're not going to have graduate students who can help faculty with their research and scholarly producti productivity, where are we going to find some students that might be able to fill that gap? And so the undergraduate fellowship program was getting money to pay the students. Again, not a big deal. We got the money pretty easily. And it enabled faculty to use some of our more talented undergraduates in that kind of research capacity. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's funny, until you mentioned that, I'd forgotten that. And you know, I still to this day, have people talk about having undergraduate fellows and the work that they do for them. And that, I mean, I'm not gonna say the program when I, when I thought about doing it was an afterthought. It's just that, again, with some students on the student, student Honors Council, I said, is there a more formal way that we can be involved working with faculty members? And oh, by the way, maybe we get paid for it. Mm -hmm. I said, well, it's student wage money. Okay, well then why don't you go get some student wage money and that'll be the basis for creating the Undergraduate Fellows Program, and that's that's what it was. So in that case, mm -hmm. unlike the Whitinger Scholars, you did have to explore a revenue stream to make sure that it would be viable? Well, only in the sense that <laughs> the student wage budget is in academic affairs. Uh, Jim Cook was the provost. And when I came up with the idea and presented it to Jim Cook, he was the one who said to me, well, we'll take it out of the, out of the uh, student wage budget. So instead of spending the money to, I don't know, this isn't really accurate, but instead of spending it on more people to go work in the gym, you know, mm -hmm. counting or how many people. cafeteria? Are, yeah. Well, no, that's dining. That that's was dining. dining. Okay. But uh, student assistance in an office. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, things. exactly. And so why not give them an opportunity to have, and Jim was the person who loved doing this, something they can put on their CV. You know, I was an undergraduate fellow for, for Professor Doyle, and we worked on this. And we thought, well, there's an academic overlay to this. Let's go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that was one of the reasons why we did the Undergraduate Fellows mm -hmm. Program. And that was a great success. Um, and yet, in our conversation today, I'd kind of forgotten about it. And yet, it's one of the programs that still to this day, I'll say, well, are you working with Susie or Johnny? Yeah, he or she is my undergraduate fellow. So mm -hmm. it was something we did. And we didn't, we thought a lot about it at the time, but had not, I have not thought a lot about it since that time. Well, so here's a tribute. Yeah. I'm relying on research oh. that Ben Wilson, a yeah. public history major, sure. did as my honors undergraduate really? fellow in the fall, <laughs> okay. where he left no stone unturned, yeah. Yeah. including uh, files in the Honors College office that yeah. haven't made it to the archives. Yeah. Uh, and then with his assistant, we are making these primary source documents that he scanned yeah. available to yeah. the students who are going yeah. to be researching and interviewing yeah. the 30-some people that we know, doing. It's funny, there are a lot of these kind of programs that I sort of, I, I, I chuckle about because one that, I don't want to get too far afield on this, but one that, I, that we're doing all the environmental things that we began doing in the 1980s as well. Um, I had this program for a long time out of the provost's office called Green for Green, 
where it was a way to give faculty money in the summer if they could think of ways to incorporate environmental things into their courses. <laughs> and so what are you going to call that? Oh, it's green for green. So if you, if you come up with a good idea, I'll give you some summer money. Summer teaching getting to be more scarce. This is in the uh, probably early 90s more than any other time. And so, you know, undergraduate fellows, green for green, there are all kinds of these things that were kicking around. Mm -hmm. The Honors Undergraduate Fellow uh, Program, like the Whiting Air Scholars, yeah. continue on from that point yeah. of time. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, Oxford uh, opportunity has right. uh, uh, ceased, but would you say, as you look back on those uh, unique contributions under your uh, stewardship of uh, honors, uh, for the most part, they have made, uh, they be become institutionalized and, and persist in the present? Yeah, I think the only one that well, the only one that hasn't been institutionalized, and I wish it had become institutionalized, is the program with Oxford. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that was just simply something that uh, President Gora and Provost King decided they didn't want to fund. And the money really came out of the provost's office. I mean, it was, it was, the, it was money in my budget. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a decision. I mean, you decide, okay, you got so much money you can use, free capital, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you want to emphasize? I, I don't know what they emphasize instead of that. I can't think of anything. But they didn't want to use it on that. Okay, so that line, if you will, got crossed out in the provost budget. Mm -hmm. All the others, I think, have survived and done pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the environmental things we began doing in the early 1990s seems to become an empire unto itself. Uh, so there are all kinds of initiatives of that kind. Mm -hmm. And certainly all of them in the Honors College have continued and have gone way beyond that. I mean, I think of... Uh, well, I mean, a couple of observations. I and mean, I think of Jim Rubel being able to get full-time contract lines for people to teach solely in the Honors College was an, an absolute coup. I mean, I think it's, I mean, high marks to Jim for thinking of doing that and for President Gora and Provost King for funding that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a number of accomplishments that came much later that I think are really important in setting the stage for what Honors is mm -hmm. now with its position in the central part of the campus, and I think position in the central part of the university academic structure. Mm -hmm. Well, those things had to begin somewhere, mm -hmm. and to pull off getting full-time contract positions, I mean, I, I never thought of doing that. And even when I was the provost, I never had Arno Whittaker or Bruce Myers say, why don't you give me some positions? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think of it. Jim was kind of forced into it because he was losing the contacts that I had with individual faculty to teach in the Honors College, and he was having a difficult time just staffing classes. Exactly. So in his case, he was pretty much, look, Provost King and President Gora, I really need to have these lines. Mm -hmm. And they agreed he was right. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they got those positions. So I think there are a number of things like that that are really important mm -hmm. in the, recent, the more recent history of honors education mm -hmm. at Ball State. So in the context of that era, as I recall, because now this yeah. intersects with my being here from 96 right. on, um, there are tenure lines that were not being renewed. Yep, right. uh, there was a change from the deans having control over tenure lines within their college right. to that being absorbed into the yeah. provost office. Yeah. And um, there just weren't, quote unquote, spare faculty right. who right. could uh, teach yeah. outside of what the department had yeah. to offer within their right. majors. Right. Uh, so at that point, if you wanted to have a going concern, and you mm -hmm. couldn't borrow faculty. Yeah, um, no, they right. needed it. And yeah. fortunately, there was an, uh, a recognition that as the mm -hmm. only college on campus that did not have its own faculty, right. Right. Uh, that this was the time uh, to move that direction. So to put this back to um, and connect it to with something that you remarked on earlier, yeah. honors uh, in your uh, association with it was always able to get things done if the pitch said, this isn't going to cost Ball State any money. So mm -hmm. residence life, you could get yeah. dorm rooms, yeah. that wasn't costing anything. Right. The borrowing privileges at the library, yeah, right. registering uh, early, mm -hmm. um, you know, none of those things cost a right. cent. Um, when the Board of Trustees approved the change uh, of the name from Honors Program to Honors College, it stipulated that this would not result in an increase in pay right, yeah, right. for the person who's yeah. now going to be designated as right. dean right. instead of director. Yeah. So this now involves a commitment on Ball mm -hmm. State's behalf to give yeah. money for the yeah. hiring of long-term contract faculty. Mm -hmm. Uh, so comment on that. Does that uh, sort of indicate that you had to have decades 
of proving that honors was centrally important to Ball State's identity and its success, well, and now they needed to actually fund ten, uh, yeah, faculty lines. Probably, because as I said, Jim was pretty much forced into that. It's either you let me do this or we don't staff the classes. Well, they weren't going to let that happen. I, I think a lot about that because I guess the reason why I never thought of doing it was because I had no difficulty getting faculty. And would Jim have thought of it if he had had no difficulty getting faculty? I don't really know. Um, honors colleges nationally do that kind of thing in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Some have positions that are within the college. Some do the borrowing that we used to do all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I mean, that, that, that's a very good question, but I don't, I don't know how to answer it because mm -hmm. you're, you're pushed into a position and then you got to decide how you're going to try and solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that was Jim's solution to the problem. And to turn it completely on its head, I'm not so sure what Jim would have done if the provost and president said, no, you got to go find somebody else. There was no there there. Mm -hmm. there. There was no, no other faculty. No, you couldn't get any faculty to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jim, and I want to make a, a, an important point here about his work as honors dean, Jim had by that time become a, a, a major national figure in leadership of the National Collegiate Honors Council, which is, that's no small thing. And I I'd gotten involved a little bit, Arno a little bit, Bruce Meyer maybe a little less, but one of the high marks I give to Jim during his career as dean here was that he got into the upper echelon of the National Collegiate Honors Council and ended up as the president of it. And I, I never thought he got enough credit on campus for, I mean, that's a really big deal organization, much more important now than it was when I was honors director. And so to have a Ball State faculty member, a Ball State dean, of honors, who is the president of the national organization, to me that was a really big deal. Uh, and so he was a national leader in honors education, and I emphasize that, not just to say, you know, way to go, Jim, but I think those kinds of contacts gave him more access to what other honors college deans were doing to try to solve this problem. And I don't know whether, you know, his friend at Cincinnati or his friend at Colorado Boulder said, well, why don't you try and ask the provost and the president for this, that, and the other thing. I don't know how much asking Jim did like that. Mm -hmm. In my case, as you pointed out quite accurately, you were asking for a lot of things didn't cost an awful lot of money. Mm -hmm. Few did, like undergraduate fellows or whatever scholars, but a lot of those other things didn't. Well, in Jim's case, you're talking about faculty slots, mm -hmm. and that's a really big deal, mm -hmm. especially at a time when Ball State is cutting away at those kinds of positions. Right. So to me, that's, that's just an absolute coup mm -hmm. in terms of what he was able to do as Dean of the Honors College. Mm -hmm. We're closing in on the final uh, 10 minutes or so sure. of, of the interview, and I wanted to uh, uh, talk about your move from uh, Honors to uh, acting provost in 1985 yeah, right, and right. then becoming the provost in right. 1986. When you moved up the echelon uh, to become the uh, you know, chief academic officer yeah. for the university, to what extent uh, were you involved in stewardship of the honors uh, college within all of the colleges? I mean, yeah, did right. it occupy kind of a special place <laughs> in your heart, or did you yeah. have to now not put it uh, oh, first among uh, equals? Honors always occupied a special place in my heart, and, I, and the other deans used to tease me about that. I mean, I... My career in becoming the provost of a mid-sized American university is about as atypical as you can get. I mean, you, you can't be an honors dean and then the next thing you become is a provost. That just doesn't happen. Um, because what people want to see is line responsibility, working with budgets and things like that, which is to say a real college dean and not an honors dean, but a dean of a college of sciences and humanities or a dean of a college of business. In my case, it was really being the right place, the per right person in the right place at the right time because Jim Cook basically told me, I had no interest in senior administration at all, and Jim Cook said to me, you've got it too good over there in the Honors College. You're going to become the associate provost. So this is misery loves company. Yeah, I mean, I, and so, <laughs> you know, Jim Cook was a person that I don't know if anybody ever said no to him. I didn't. Maybe Joanne Gora did, but I doubt it. Um, and so he said, I'd like you to come over into central administration. You may recall that the associate provost, the first one, was a history colleague named George Pilcher. 
And uh, George had come here from being the chair of the department at Colorado Boulder. Didn't work out with Jim Cook. And so Jim said, you know, you're going back to the department. And Warren Vanderhoof is going to be the acting associate provost. And then we're going to do an in-house search. And he's going to become the associate provost. And I thought Jim would stick around here for a while. And then he, begot, he became the president of the University of Montana. And so I was in a then a national search uh, with, uh, for that position and then became provost and academic vice president. But I mean, the credentials I had were really in-house credentials. And that I had been here. People knew my work. Uh, Jim had been really a tough guy, a real you know, provost who wanted to mold and shape the university. And when you do those kinds of things, you make a lot of enemies. And so in Jim's case, with Jim leaving, I was the in-house candidate. I had a chance to be associate provost for a while. And so I got into the search. And John Worthen liked what I was doing. He had just come as president the year before. And so John asked me if I would be the provost. And that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. But as far as a credentialing thing, people with my credentials don't become provosts of mid-American size institutions. But I was there and ended up with this position. But going back to your original question, mm -hmm. did that mean that even though I had come out of an honors college, uh, now I had to look at other colleges and indeed had something to do with creating one, the College of Communication, Information, and Media. Um, and they were all very important. But I would be less than honest if I said to you that honors did not occupy, occupy a special place in my heart, because it always did. Mm -hmm. And Arnold Wittig knew that as dean, and Bruce Meyer, and then Arnold later again. And so the honors dean always had a good amount of entree, shall we say, mm -hmm. <laughs> into the provost's office. Mm -hmm. And so ideas that came out of the honors college were, if they made sense, usually looked upon favorably. Could you give an example or two? Uh, I think, I mean, in Arno's case, he was trying to do um, some changes with a lot of the curricular structures, some changes within the residence hall uh, programs of, of honors. And I, I always said, you know, go, go for it. I'd be happy to support you. Some with dollars. Keep in mind that the money to send students over to Oxford and the faculty members came out of the provost's office. So that was a separate line item in the budget. So those are good examples of how we did that. Mm -hmm. Looking back uh, from your perch <laughs> and our four hours of conversation Lofty. about your career yeah, in the right. Honors College, yeah. is there anything I haven't asked you about that you uh, would like to have entered into the record of uh, your uh, view of the Honors College history or Ball State history? No, I think you've been very comprehensive. But again, four hours is four hours. And I'm happy that we got in the undergraduate fellows program because I probably would have going back to my home this evening and thought, oh my gosh, how could we leave that out? So I think it's a very comprehensive look. Uh, I think that you and your students and maybe some future generations, people will look at this and maybe get some insights out of how this happened and how this story really of success, but success based on the support of an awful lot of people who believed in what I was doing and what these students were doing and were able to come forward and say, yeah, we think this is a good idea. On behalf of the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project, I cannot thank you enough for having given us your attention and time, and also for all of the different ways that you have helped to serve this institution. You're very welcome. Thank you for the privilege.